want to invite uh, to make welcoming remarks, uh, Ms. Katrine Seder, who is the regional director on the, of the Henrich Ball uh, Stifton. It is my honor and my pleasure to welcome you here to this public forum on 100 days of the Jubilee government. But as George has said, the Heinrich Böll Foundation is only one of the hosts and the organizers of this forum. So I would also like to welcome you on behalf of the Center for Multi-Party Democracy, the Africa Research and Resource Forum, the Center for Governance and Development, I Choose Life Africa, the National Women's Steering Committee, and the Elections Observation Group. The forum is inspired by the first hundred days. And so you can imagine that it has been long in the making. So I would like to start to thank the partners, and especially also our team at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, for their enthusiasm, for their commitment, and their really hard work to put this forum together here today. The first hundred days of the Jubilee government. It has been argued that a hundred days are not sufficient to measure success. Some have argued that in itself the hundred days yardstick is a very artificial concept and it's foreign and why should it apply to Kenya? So in general we do agree that the 100 days are not a perfect measure, but we still believe that it is a very useful one. Why? First of all, the Jubilee Coalition itself entered in the campaign trail with very concrete pledges for the first 100 days as the Jubilee government. So may it be a foreign concept or not, the 100 days benchmark was used to demonstrate strong and transparent commitment towards immediate measures that would make Kenya a fairer, a healthier, and a better educated country. And those pledges were very well received by the public. Polls show that half of the population clearly remembers the promises that were made with regards to healthcare, to education, in particular, the one laptop per child project. Second, there is a general understanding that the power and influence of a new leadership is indeed at the greatest during its first few months in office. This is a time when the leadership style is still fresh and when there is a certain aura of victory. The first that has been using it has been President Franklin D. Roosevelt his bold actions and his leadership in addressing enormous challenges that the United States were facing during the time of the Depression in the 1930s have served as a model for many presidents to come. And indeed, he's been very effective. In the first 100 days after taking office, he passed 15 bills through Congress. And what most importantly, he won back the trust of the people and they knew that America could weather the storm. So the 100 days, hence, serve more as a kind of a symbolic period. But most importantly, the idea asks for public engagement. It is a clear and an open invitation to Kenyans to engage in dialogue with its new government on progress, on challenges, and it provides an opportunity for the government to ensure that it remains relevant and aligns with the priorities of its citizens. The Heinrich Böll Foundation and its partners are pleased to host this forum as such a space, as a platform for this dialogue. The Heinrich Böll Foundation is a German Green Foundation affiliated with the Green Party in Germany and it is part of the Global Green Movement a movement which owes its success to a very large degree to vibrant and sustained citizen participation. So I'm really happy to see you all having come here honoring our invitation. Welcome to all of you and thank you for being us, with us this afternoon.
We are about to get into the session proper, which, as you've been told, is going to be moderated by Udwak Amimu. Before we do that, we're going to have a small introductory session, about four minutes. It's not going to be anybody speaking about the subject, but rather a video clip that's going to be played. We in the Jubilee have audaciously reimagined a brand new Kenya. We have dared to dream afresh. In keeping with our motto, Tunamini Yawesekana Kusema na Kutenda, we have already made plans to start transforming Kenya from day one. In the first hundred days of the Jubilee government, we will take measures to make Kenya a fairer, healthier, and better educated country. We will stock local health centers with drugs and equipment necessary to treat all Kenyans. We will also abolish the fees currently charged at dispensaries and health centers. We promise to abolish maternity fees and charges in all public hospitals. We will pass legislation to ensure that every Kenyan child under 18 years is either in school or a training institution. We will pass the necessary legislation to operationalize the youth empowerment program. We will provide every standard one child with a solar powered laptop. We shall sustain this program for every succeeding year until every child in primary school has a bag and a laptop. I believe there was a kana kusema na Thank you very much. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Without spending any more time, I want to welcome Woodwork to conduct the rest of the session. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming in. And so, as um, Ms. Katrine uh, said, we have an anchor piece which I believe you have in your folders. And that will be presented to us uh, by Dr. Godwin Murunga, um, who's a senior research fellow um, at the Institute for Development Studies at the University of Nairobi. He's going to take just about 10 minutes of our time, and then we'll come to the panel to hear their perspectives on the 100 days of the government um, as we know it. So um, uh, without further ado, Dr. Murunga. The first thing I want to do is to dispel the expectation that this is an audit of the Jubilee government in 10, in, I mean in 100 days. Uh, the president has already made his plea on this. Uh, in his own words, he said, you don't get two people married and then you expect a child in three months. Um, that was his powerful plea that uh, he needs more time, the government needs more time, and I think it would be unfair for us to expect anything different. So what I want to do is not to conduct an audit of the achievements, the achievements in 100 days. What I want to do is to begin to look at what the emerging trends are and what they tell us about the future. And I want to do this with the knowledge that we are dealing with issues to do with governance, we are dealing with issues to do with uh, development. And none of those things is an event. They, they don't happen instantly, the way you would say uh, PESA PAP, for instance. Uh, it's a complex process. Uh, you make gains, you lose, you wake up and recollect for the following, for the following day and all that. So what really is, is important to me is to put on the table the idea, the analysis that we need to make of the 100 days of Jubilee government uh, is important as a way of beginning to look at the trends and begin to understand where we are going as a nation. What were the key promises that were made by the Jubilee government? The, 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 the short clip uh, basically highlighted, of course, the maternity fees have been waived. There's an element about free access to the clinics and dispensaries that has fallen off the radar. Uh, it's important that we begin to professionalize some of our thinking around these issues, especially in terms of how you turn a campaign promise, waive the fees into a long-term sustainable and well-thought-out program that begins to address broader issues in society rather than just a, look, look, uh, you know, a very quick, quickly implemented thing. The debate around laptops is still with us. It's going to be with us for a very long time. 
uh, Mugo, I think Mugo will talk about this because I read in his article that this is really the basis for the development of the e-system of digitizing government and all this. Uh, it is going to be a huge debate. I think we need to think about the laptop issue a little bit more than we have done so far. I'll be very brief. I've just gone through the paper. And thank you very much, uh, Godwin, for, I think, a pretty fair, you'd agree, um, assessment of the first 100 days because we want a candid assessment. Um, comments. Uh, I did pen an article, that's correct. And I want to start the way I started my article on Sunday by saying that devolution, or rather the process of moving from the old system of government to the new system of government is unprecedented. Yes, we passed the constitution about three years ago, but the fact of the matter is that the true and real transition especially in terms of governance, began after the election. And therefore, this 100 days, this one year, these five years, will be unlike any other um, 100 days or one year or five years of previous governments. Because um, the notion of devolution is not one that can be taken lightly. And there have been challenges. So I would start by saying that you cannot make an assessment of the first 100 days without acknowledging the challenges of devolution. The fact that none of us, not the president, the government, not the National Assembly, uh, not Kenyans in general, really were, would have been able to um, anticipate every single uh, uh, development uh, under devolution. The initiatives towards Mumbai support have been, I think, in the first 100 days unprecedented. I think we have seen a lot of focus on making the port of Mombasa much more efficient, um, you know, giving also the MD of KPA command and control, getting the Commission of Customs to be resident in Mombasa, ensuring that the, uh, the route from Mombasa, Nairobi to Malaba to Kampala, including discussions with the presidents of, of Rwanda and Uganda, there's a tremendous focus already in the first one. And, and, and clearly, um, the fruits will begin to emerge very, very shortly. On the issue of the one laptop per child, I think it will be, uh, I think I would be less than honest if I was to make a, if I was to avoid commenting about that very controversial project. Look, first, I want to say this. The fact that in the most remote corners of Kenya, whether Northern Kenya, as far as Turkana, Mandara, whether, uh, you know, Isabenia, Kilifi, Kwale, the fact that in the remotest parts of Kenya, parents who three months ago had never heard of the word computer, let alone laptop or tablet, are now engaging in debate about it because they all have kids is already a victory for that. In terms of the paradigm shift, Vision 2030 is about the year 2030. Transforming Kenya is about transforming this country by the year 2030. What kind of a world will seven-year-olds today, you know, a seven-year-old kid in 2030 will be 24, 25? That means they'll just begin, be beginning their work life. In what world will they be? I'll let, tell you something. We have no clue. We have no idea, and we should pretend. We should prepare them. And the paradigm shift required to make sure that regardless of where you were born, whether you're in a classroom under a tree or in a classroom such as this, you need to be prepared for the E age, for the knowledge age, because the world will be one little global village and it will most certainly and firmly be an E, an IT, a knowledge world, a knowledge economy in which anybody who cannot fit in will be obsolete. So the paradigm shift is important. I also think, and I indicated that you should know that under Vision 2030, we've got programs such as digitizing the entire government, the entire system, so to speak, over the next five years. Lands registry, company registry. The way you run your life will be electronic. And the private sector, and Carol will confirm, will respond in kind. In fact, in many cases, the private sector is ahead. So your whole life will be an electronic life. So if you're seven years old today, that's what we should be preparing you for. Um, I, I just want to react to only one subject in terms of presentation of Dr. Murunga. 
the issue of devolution. I'm not a guru of devolution, as uh, is peddled sometimes. I'm a student of devolution. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a short while. First of all, I think um, I agree with uh, Dr. Kibati that these 100 days should not be so much about uh, how much has been delivered, but basically about what planning structures have we put in place and whether those structures, whether the planning, whether the structures we are putting in place are proper enough to enable us to respond uh, in the long, many years um, down the line on issues that we are supposed to address as a country. We have a very difficult uh, responsibility of one, deciding to go for the quick wins or establishing a foundation that will ensure that either you know the counties are going to stand for 50 years you know the biggest problem in this country is that everybody everybody wherever you go they want to threaten you with a re-election of 2017 so the only thing that one day even the citizens want to procure in the minds of politicians with is that way 2017 you will see you know now if we are going to do things because of 2017 it is so simple i'll stop doing the things i do in this house here I look for little money, I'll be busy like a broker out there, get some little amount of money, and I go around El Gio Maracuay doing fundraisings. Then 2017 I'll be re-elected. But that will not, uh, you know, lay a proper foundation for that county or for the country. So we need to ask ourselves the first question. Are we doing things for re-election or we are doing them for posterity? Are we leading because we want to be re-elected or we are driven by compassion? must we be re-elected? That's the question. So if we are looking at the manifesto, the policies we put in place, we must be able to think about uh, we should do these things, not because we'll be asked 2017 that you promised and you never did, but we must be honest to our people. If we need to change something, we'll say we'll change it uh, because it matters, it's better for the country. That is my, my take on these issues. I'm really against this, uh, this idea of 100 days. i tell you why. When the NAC government was formed, and I was Minister for Planning and National Development, uh, that somehow we had made the mistake of saying we will do certain things in 100 days. And then I was Minister for Planning, and then after two weeks, Tom O'Wood, who was the CEO of Federation of Kenya Employers, calls me and said, have you created the 500,000 jobs that you promised? So I thought he was joking, but he wasn't joking, because he kept on like that systematically for the next couple of weeks until I was forced to go to his office on the hill to sit down with him for three hours to explain exactly what we're doing. I think what we need to do uh, when people come into government, uh, and I'm, I, I'm glad somebody said that election manifestos are promises. That's a very, very good explanation, or definition of manifestos. What we need to do is what, to do what Godwin put in the form of a question. And I hope you noted that question. How do you deal with campaign promises which do not have a home in public policy? How do you deal with campaign promises which do not have a home, have a home in, in public policy? And to me, that is what confronted me as Minister for Planning, that we needed to have a home of our campaign manifesto as NAC then, which was democracy and empowerment. And therefore, what we embarked on immediately was to work on the economic recovery strategy for wealth and employment creation, which to us was the most important thing to do. Now, what I would have expected of the Jubilee government is to translate their manifesto into public policy and bring that document to the National Assembly and to the Senate so that it becomes a national document, not a party's thing. It becomes something that Parliament has approved of so that you begin weeding off the excesses or promises which cannot fit into public policy and focusing on a roadmap that is implementable. Carol, um, from what you've heard so far, um, is it too soon to say that we should expect better or should we be worried if we're talking about um, issues like trust and integrity? Um, and these, of course, apply when you come to the private sector. The private sector is one of the, I think Kamoto alluded to that and said we have a role as a citizen.
to hold the government um, accountable, but also to play our role. And one of the roles that the private sector has been doing with this current new government is to really monitor what's been happening. And we've been playing it in two ways. There was the issue that was mentioned about public policy, what is in and what is not. And what we've done in, pri uh, in private sector is pick up what is in the public policy that has been promised or what has, has been said to be done and start monitoring that, but also play our role to work with government on that. And I'll just, and then the second area is the political support because some of the things haven't happened in the past because of lack of political, what we'd call political will or political support. And so for us, it's really working with the political government or the executive to really push for the political support. And some of those things were mentioned by Mugo as the port of Mombasa. So I'll not go into what has been said, but I'll highlight a few things of what have we really been monitoring from the private sector. And from the public policy, some of the things that were promised to by, by the Jubilee government for the first 100 days or part of this year are some of the bills that really affect the private sector, but also the public. And one of it was the VAT bill, which has had a lot of discussion around. But one of the things for us, why we wanted it fast-tracked is because it would bring efficiency and also simplification of the VAT. Right now, KRA owes the private sector about 30 billion Kenya shillings in terms of VAT refunds. And part of that, well, some of them is genuine and fraudulent claims. Some of that is because of the complexity of the VAT bill. And so for us, we wanted to see a bill that was more simplified so that it, it's easier to, to deal with some of these issues like VAT refunds. But also to realize that even with the current VAT bill, there's some weaknesses. And so what we've been doing is identifying those weaknesses and working together with government through the treasury, but also parliament to, uh, to look at those weaknesses. The other one is public procurement and disposal act. Again, that has um, led to a lot of corruption, lack of transparency, and lack of uh, uh, efficiency in service delivery. So one of the, that was one of the things that was promised by the Jubilee government that is one of the things they'll look at in the first 100 days. And we've seen them put it out um, to, for, to us to look at it, to the, to the citizens to engage in it. One of the, um, the things that, um, that needs to be included that hasn't been there is local participation, especially in the, for the youth, the women, and the MSC entrepreneurs. We've talked about, and what was mentioned is the current, the new youth fund and the women fund that now has a framework to be institutionalized at CDF level. But part of that is to ensure that the, the goods that are procured come from these sectors. And so the, the reason for us to look at the Procurement and uh, Disposal Act was particularly that to see that there's local participation, but it's reviewed so that it, um, it, it's reformed, the systems are reformed to, uh, to, to allow for efficiency. And I want us to look back at the campaign time, where every political party was saying, we are youthful, we are digital. It was fashionable to be young then. And the language of competition was edge. And see what the young people did in the political parties, formulating manifestos, doing the public relations, writing speeches, everything about the campaign. They delivered to a large extent. But after the Jubilee government came to power, of course, everyone's, almost everyone's expectations was that young people will take a larger chunk of some of those senior positions. But then, see, the whole cabinet, no person is young. Principal secretaries, no person under 35. So why is it fashionable to be young at campaign time and you know doing the campaigning, making rounds? And when it comes to sharing the power, allocating the power, it's... You, you, you have to be crowned an elder of a certain community for you to get the power. You have to, to appear old for you to get the power, for you to get the chance to serve your nation. Why? First 100 days, Jubilee government, politically speaking, no, they did not perform. Uh, there has been no 
dialogue, there's been no um, consultation in terms of the frameworks that are being put in place. And the first 100 days, as has been said by other speakers, is really about laying the framework, the policies that will allow for engagement for the next five years. And so it is worrisome when the cabinet secretary goes ahead and adopts a mechanism that has not worked very well. And by saying that they want to adopt the CDF model for disbursement uh, of, of these funds, it raises some questions on political interference because we are well aware that when the president made the declaration that the six billion that had been saved from uh, the, re, uh, the rerun, that this money would be put towards women and youth empowerment, there was then a clamor from the politicians that they be the ones to handle this fund. So we know, we all know the history of CDF. Well, maybe it is a good concept, but the way it has been handled is worrisome. We have uh, Kamodo Waiganjo, who at the CIC looks after public finances. But um, Kipchumba posed a question there that are we focusing on the right reforms. And of course, as the CIC, you often have to step in to arbitrate when um, there are violations of the Constitution. So what's your take on, on, on what we've just heard? Uh, th thanks, Udwak. And uh, I'm glad to be here to share this afternoon with the fellow Kenyans. I think, let me say that, um, because we're talking about 100 days, I think it's important to understand the context uh, why this sort of forum is important. Because quite apart from assessing whether government has been effective, it's also asking the question whether government is trustworthy. And you know, it doesn't matter how, how effective a government is. If we don't trust government, then it becomes very difficult for that government to pull us together to, towards a common objective in terms of getting the country moving together. And I think the essence why governments keep promises, even when the promises are unreasonable, is because if governments appear to promise to get into office, and then when they get into office, they start to explain why that is impossible, it becomes an issue of trust. And so sometimes governments will proceed with an issue because it is more important sometimes to keep trust than to be right. You know, And especially in a context like this, where over years governments have lied and then always explained why this is impossible. It is very important to maintain that trust and to ensure that governments are trustworthy. Because if we don't trust government, we cannot be a country together. So, so I think it's important to understand that context. Governments, it's also important that governments set the right tone. It doesn't matter how effective the president of Kenya is. If he doesn't set the right tone for, for, for nationhood, it doesn't matter which other very nice programs are going to happen. The reality is that as a country, will not be moving together. So I think this, this 100 days is not always about whether government has accomplished in terms of development programs, it's also whether government has set the right tone. And that's a question which we should be asking. Is the gov does the government look trustworthy? Especially in a country which is divided right down the middle, because that is how Kenyans we vote. We vote generally right down the middle. And our elections probably for some time are going to be contested elections, naturally. So it's important that that, especially for those that didn't vote, vote for government, feel that this is a government that we can trust. So, so let me say that um, it, it's important that we recognize that the Constitution introduces many challenges. It comes with many challenges. But good people, the good thing is that we are now a nation which have a disagreement on ideas. You know, you know we're having a contest of ideas, which is a good thing. Nobody says devolution should not. The, or, the only difference we're having is how should it be sequenced? What should come first? What sort of power should be there? How do we manage budgets? That is a great thing for us as a nation. And let us celebrate the fact that for the first time in this country, we're having a consistent discussion on ideas and how well we can improve this country. So I pray that this discussion will also be a discussion that comes from our colleagues so that where there are challenges, we own them and not get to the point where we just ask what government is doing, what is government doing. The Constitution has given so much responsibility to the citizenry, you have no idea. The opportunities given by the Constitution must be used by you, so that when we fail, you have an opportunity to hold us accountable. Thank you very much. We will now um, take your questions. Uh, um, I, I want to direct my question actually to one of them, this Karo Karyuki of private sector, because I work with a private entity. 
and also another one to whoever comes from the Senate. <clears throat> Please, who organizers of this particular event could have also organized to have an MP so that you can have this kind of discussion more elaborate. The public policy about the six billion shillings, they, they say that they were going to allocate to the youth and the gender. Do we have anything clear that we can learn from as we are concerned in the 100 days that has passed? Then secondly, to Carol. Now, the, you talk of youths. Youths, youths, youths. Kenya National Chamber of Commerce, you are the one who retreated it. And you say you are going to allocate one position for the youth. That never happened. What went wrong? Thank you. Women are known to be or has been posited as the enemies of their own. How do you handle that? A case in example, Kathy was supposed to be running for senator for the first time, but she was taken out by a lady. Another question goes to the senators, the two senators. You admitting you you're admitting clearly well that the people as well as yourselves do not seem to understand the gist of devolution. But we are in a position whereby each and every person talks as if they are experts of devolution. When are you going to educate yourselves properly well, as well as the people who are down in your various counties? Honorable Nyang Nyong, are we going to be in a position whereby we play political games for the entire period as it was recorded during the coalition government, whereby there is politics each and every day as we wake up, there is politics. My name is Josiah Adiamadema from Kenya National Debate Council. We have a case whereby the registrar of political parties will always allocate some money for some political parties, probably the most successful ones. But here comes a question of account accountability. How does the government ensure that each political party cutters for the interests of the students, the plight of youths, and the plight of girl child, and the needy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me attempt to answer your question by responding, yes, KEPSA is the apex body, and the Chamber of Commerce is a member of KEPSA, but for every association, they have their memorandum and articles of understanding, and so they do decide how they are going to do their elections for their board. So I'm not able to say that the Chamber of Commerce did say they're going to have a member of the youth in their board. Uh, in their board. I can only inquire and find out if they had committed to do that and if it was in their MNA, why they did not do that. Steve Bickos' question was not asked to anyone in particular about the law on political party funds. I think... Uh, the Political Parties Act is the one that provides for how the funds uh, for political parties are supposed to be used. One is I would imagine that the youth are members of those political parties before they can benefit from the funds of political parties. Two, that those funds are generally supposed to be uh, to help with the infrastructure of running the political party. Three, I would hope therefore that the youth who are members would therefore also be part of the structures that determine how that money is utilized. Because the political parties registrar, who is their accounting, uh, who sort of uh, has the accountability mechanism, only looks at the budgets of the political parties, sees whether they fit within the law, but the process of approving those budgets are, de are dependent on the members and the officials they elect. So for the youth to be able to have uh, benefits, because these are institutions, for you to be able to benefit from the funds that are granted to political parties, membership, officials, then you can determine how monies are used for the benefit and welfare of the youth. But that depends on how the structures of the political party are. And I would suggest that the youth get a little more involved in political parties, not just during campaign season, but in terms of managing them uh, when, especially soon after elections, when the focus is away on the parties. Uh, that may be very, very useful in terms of ensuring funds are properly used. Okay, Professor Ask me about politics. Politics must be there all the time. But don't think that people only play politics. People do a lot of other things. They enter planes, travel, they farm their farms, they 
they come to meetings like this. It's a myth that people play politics all the time. I don't do that myself. And I'm sure a common doesn't do it. And uh, secondly, senators know a lot about devolution, by the way. If, if Prince McConnell was humble enough to say that he's a student devolution, that is his nature. He has to be humble. But of course, being a student means you are learning. Nobody, learning is not a bad thing, by the way. I mean, learning is a very good thing. So, so if people say they are learning, it doesn't mean that they don't know. They, it's only that they want to know more. So, so don't say that if, if, if he says he's learning, he doesn't know. I mean, that's not good English. Uh, <laughs> now, civic education, I think this is a, it is not the role of the Senate alone to do civic education. It's our role. And, uh, uh, you know, civil society organizations have been doing it. The government is expected to do it under county government act. And uh, that's the county governments, the national government is to do it. So it's a collective duty. The only challenge we have is that I have seen that very little resources have been put in the relevant ministry to deal with these issues. And second is that it may not be very coordinated. But sometimes I think even the citizens at the local level know much more than some of us who are in uh, these big offices and towns and universities. Uh, you, most likely the people in the village know a lot because uh, they are willing to listen to the many programs that are taking place. But this is something that needs to be done. How can the government ensure political parties know that has been answered? The six billion. Uh, I think um, the, if you saw the promise for Jubilee government, it says that we will table a law that will provide the framework. Uh, the discussion now is why can't we use the youth fund and women fund that is existing or revamp it? Why do we come with a new law and so forth? But that will be the discussion once a framework has been drafted. It could be a law that will repeal the existing uh, provisions and revamp these institutions to be able to carry forward. Last, what, what Professor said about uh, learning, when I said, you know, we must keep learning, is basically all of us to have that humility to be willing to accept that other people know and therefore take over the whole consultation process before we do things rather than just doing it and, and let me say this with all due respect because I'm on record on that. Uh, I've always said if our chairman, our, our speaker at the National Assembly was a little bit willing to entertain the possibility that other people could know things more than himself, we would have uh, solved some of the problems that we are having between National Assembly and Senate. Um, thank you. Uh, on women being their own worst enemies. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that women are not homogeneous, okay? And I, I, I fail to see why when women engage with politics um, that suddenly they are considered uh, enemies of themselves. Nobody is saying that um, Evans Kidero, the governor of Nairobi, and Waitito are enemies, that men are enemies of you know, their own worst enemies. I suppose because women, uh, there are fewer women in the political arena. So when women engage adversarially, um, it looks like they are their own worst enemies. But I think that it is important to note that they are not. It is simply a political contest. And that is how politics is structured. And I think that the case that you've mentioned is a case in and of itself, and it goes way beyond... Uh, women against women. It is uh, political parties fighting it out and issues of registration. Um, I wanted to mention about this thing of the political fund, apart from what uh, Co Commissioner Waiganja has said, um, it is true you definitely need to be a member of a political party, but within the Political Parties Act, um, Section 26 of the Political Parties Act requires that all political parties use 30% of their funds to promote um, the, the, the participation and representation of youth, women, minorities, disabled and ethnic minorities within the political parties. But for you to be able to benefit from that, you have to be a member of that political party. Of course, one of the questions that we need to be asking is who is ensuring that political parties actually use the funds for that because there is within the law a penalty 
that if political parties do not use that 30% for the intended purposes, then there should be a penalty. But where does this oversight belong? With the registrar of political parties who disperses that fund. So I think that that's really where the question is, on being able to audit political parties on how they use the funds that they are given by the, the taxpayers towards uh, ensuring that political parties become uh, institution, that they are institutionalized and that they actually promote the participation of all the two. Great, so that's the end of the panel discussion. Um, my thanks to this distinguished um, panel. It's been a pleasure um, listening to you and learning from you and hearing your different perspectives. Uh, thank you all for engaging, participating, asking questions. My apologies to those of you who um, weren't able to ask your questions. It was obviously a very good turnout and most of you were very keen to participate. Apologies because the time was short. I'll now hand you over back to Mr. George Omondi. Thank you very much, um, uh, the moderator, Uduak, and the panelists. I am not going to attempt to summarize. I think our objectives, as those who convened this forum, I can say here, have been achieved. We have had very important contributions, beginning with the declaration at the start that it is not very easy to assess a government within the first 100 days. I think I will be... I will be messing it up if I attempted to, to, to summarize or even recap. I don't know whether by now you have made a decision whether how the government is doing. Is, uh, how would you rate uh, the government from this discussion? Have you concluded or are you unclear even? If you are to give it a, a score of 10 out of 10, how many would give the government 10 out of 10? If you could, please lift up your hand. Okay, no one. What about 9? How many would give 9? This is basic Sinovate uh, statistics. What about eight? How many will give eight? Nyan? Seven? Oh, this one? Oh, this one, courageous. Okay, two, three hands, possibly. What about six? Six. How many will give six? Maybe about ten. What about five? How many will give five? Uh, five, okay, maybe a bit less. What about four? Okay, uh, what about two? What about three? Okay. <laughs> All right, so you have it. About six, it's a, you know, many, most people give about six, and I think you have your reasons for that. Uh, all we can say is that then we can say it's a pass, isn't it? It's a pass with a lot of uh, room for improvement. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Udwak, and your team for doing a fantastic job. Uh, Murunga for leading the discussion. Please uh, feel free to go, to go out uh, and uh, be refreshed. And thank you so much for coming. May God bless you as you go. Mm -hmm.